Hello and welcome to another lecture in the Abralinha Ao Vivo series. Abralinha Ao Vivo is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. The purpose of the series is to give students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussion on the most diverse topics related to the study of the human language. Today, I'd like to introduce Simon Kirby, Professor of Language Evolution at the University of Edinburgh. Simon Kirby is an elected fellow of the British Academy, Royal, Royal Society of Edinburgh, Cognitive Science Society, and a member of the Academy of Europe. He works in parallel on scientific and artistic invest investigation of cultural evolution and the origins of human uniqueness, particularly the evolution of language. He founded the Center of Language Evolution, which has pioneered techniques for growing languages in the experiment lab and exploring language evolution using, using computer simulation. The title of his lecture today is How Culture, Cultural Evolution and Self-Domestication -Dom Created Structure in Language. Questions and comments are very welcome in the chat. Right after his lecture, we will have a question and answer session. On behalf of Abralin, I'd like to thank you, Simon Kirby, for the contribution to the series. Please join me and welcome Simon Kirby. Thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation. I'm very much looking forward to talking part of this series, which it seems to me has made such a great contribution to um, uh, promoting linguistics and has been a kind of highlight of the uh, pandemic year, I think. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully that's working. Okay, so um, yes, today I'm going to talk about um, some of the work that I and my colleagues have been doing in Edinburgh on um, the cultural evolution in, of language. And I'm going to try and explain what I think the results tell us about um, the biological preconditions for language as well at the end. But before we get started, I, um, right button. I, I thought it'd be better just to give a big perspective um, on the question of what we're actually trying to do here in Edinburgh. What is an evolutionary approach to linguistics trying to explain? And sometimes when I think about this, I think that in a way, what we as evolutionary linguists are trying to tackle are the very, very basic features of language, the most fundamental features of language. These are the kinds of things that we normally talk about, maybe even in the first lecture of the of our first year linguistics course, and possibly don't really revisit later in the course. These are the things that are kind of foundational and definitional for what language is. And sometimes these things are called um, design features. So um, these are the properties that are fundamental to language, but are either absent in communication elsewhere in nature or rare. So the, the things that essentially make language what it is. Um, and there's been many, many attempts over the years to come up with kind of a shopping list of design features of language. And the ones that I'm going to focus on um, relate to uh, the structure of language. And specifically, I think what makes language really exciting to a lot of us as linguists is the idea that it exhibits systematicity at all levels of description. So um, language exhibits systematic structure. And this is something that's it's kind of so obvious to us as linguists, we don't, don't necessarily think about it too much. But in fact, it's extremely unusual. So most communication systems in nature, um, there might exist a a collection of signals, and each of those signals may have some kind of meaning to uh, the animal or uh, living system that's using them. But largely those uh, um, signals exist in isolation. So there's just a bag of independent behaviors. So for the kind of obvious canonical example of this would be the 
alarm call systems of um, some species where each alarm call corresponds to some threat, some predator, for example. Um, but there's nothing about that particular alarm call that corresponds to some kind of feature of the predator. These alarm calls are just a bag of behaviors and they're independent of each other. Now that's completely unlike language. So language, if it's anything, is um, a system of behavior where the different uh, uh, signals in a language relate to each other in many, many complex ways. Um, so language exhibits this kind of rant, rampant systematicity, and we just don't see that kind of level of systematicity in the communication systems of other species. And it's worth noting that basically all living things communicate. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity for us to see this kind of uh, systematic, uh, systematically structured communication in nature outside our species, and we just don't. Um, so that, I think, this systematicity in language is something that um, is, to my mind, the, well, one of the primary goals of an evolutionary approach to language is to understand the origins of the systematic structure. And so the kind of things that we've looked at and other colleagues have looked at from an evolutionary perspective are features like combinatoriality and compositionality. So how uh, signals in a language are made up of uh, meaningless parts that are recombined in certain ways, and also how uh, meaningful units are combined to make more complex meanings in language. So together, combinatoriality and compositionality, you can think of those as two aspects of duality of patterning, which is one of the um, most fundamental design features of language. But also the systematicity um, at higher levels of structure. For example, um, you might look at something like cross-category harmony in word order as um, being an example of systematic structure. So the idea that across different phrasal categories in a language there's a tendency to order them in the same way. Um, that is a systematic behaviour that um, spans multiple parts of the linguistic system. Recursion can be seen in, in a similar way. The idea that you can recursively combine things is um, an example of systematicity in language. And then beyond, um, beyond syntax, we can look at semantics and see things like uh, semantic convexity. So the idea that um, if you have two um, uh, meanings that are similar to each other, then other meanings that relate, uh, that are also similar, may be treated in the same way. So all of these are different aspects of systematicity, and they've all been tackled in recent years by the kinds of evolutionary approach that I'm going to lay out in this talk. So the big question for me is how do we explain this species unique systematic structure in language? Why is language but not other communication systems so systematically structured. It's, why is it shot through from everything from phonology to pragmatics? Why is there systematicity? Um, so that so that's 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 the kind of target, the explanatory target for an evolutionary approach to language. Um, now that's one unusual thing about language, but I'm now going to turn to another unusual thing about language. And that's the degree to which it's reliant on learning. So the language that we speak um, is, the reason we speak the language we do is because we're exposed to examples of that language being used around us as we develop. Now it's an obvious property of language. Now it turns out there are other communication systems in nature that involve learning, but um, it's a relatively unusual feature to have um, a, system of communication that is so heavily reliant on learning as languages. But that's not the particular thing I wanted to draw your attention to. The thing that I find very exciting about language is that um, it isn't just learned, but it's learned from the product of other learners. So this is something that we've called iterated learning. So language is transmitted over time by virtue of the fact that it's learned from observing other instances of 
linguistic behavior around you and then um, the learner goes on to produce uh, instances of linguistic behavior that are then the uh, input or that can be the input to other learners. And what this means is that language persists through this continual mapping from an external domain of utterances out in the world to an internal domain as some kind of representations in the brains of language users and then back out into the external uh, domain again. So this continual mapping backwards and forwards from cognitive representations to um, to either speech or sign in the real world and then back again has profound implications, I want to claim, for the way in which language is structured. So this process of transmission through multiple uh, iterations of learning uh, leads to the fact that language is a system that evolves culturally. So cultural evolution uh, arises from this fact that language is uh, tra transmitted over time in this way. Okay, so I've talked about two unusual things about language there. Systematic structure on the one hand and this iterated learning process on the other. So the question arises is whether these two unique things um, about language could be related. Um, and of course I wouldn't be raising that question if I didn't think the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, I want to claim that um, this process of cultural evolution that arises from iterated learning is the mechanism that delivers us linguistic structure. So just this mere fact that language is transmitted over time through this continual mapping backwards and forwards from the external domain to the internal domain and back again is sufficient to explain why language has the structure it does and specifically why it has systematic um, structure at all levels. And the way I'm going to try and convince you of that fact is by recreating this process of cultural evolution in the lab. So we're going to examine this uh, iterated learning process in miniature um, in the experiment lab. Um, that's not the only way that we've investigated this question. So we also um, have explored it by building computer simulations of the process of iterated learning. Um, but for the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about that. Well, you can ask me about it in question um, afterwards. OK, so just to give you a little roadmap for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about three experiments and they're all quite different from each other, but maybe just give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we get up to in Edinburgh. Um, so the first experiment, um, I'm going to look at the at how cultural evolution can lead to systematicity in meaningless sequences. Um, the second experiment, I'm going to look at cultural evolution leaving, leading to something much more language-like um, in an artificial sign language. So we're going to look at the cultural evolution of a miniature artificial sign language and show how it develops, or when it develops and when it doesn't develop, somewhat language-like features. Um, so those two, two experiments give you an idea of what we can do with um, recreating cultural evolution in the experiment lab with humans. Um, but for the third experiment, I'm going to show that we can actually do the same kind of thing um, in a non-human primate, and specifically in a population of baboons in the lab. This raises a little bit of a puzzling question, which is sometimes uh, I think possibly slightly erroneously uh, called Why Only Us? So if I'm able to recreate this process of uh, cultural evolution in a non-human primate, then it seems to raise the question of like, well, why is language unique to humans? And I'm going to tackle that question by looking at what we needed to put into place in our baboon experiment to get uh, uh, the system up and running and also suggest tentatively that a process of self-domestication in uh, human prehistory um, sets up two preconditions required in order for iterated learning to create language structure. And so that will frame um, the kind of, I think, the uh, biological hypotheses for what underpins language going forward.
Okay, so let's get started. So, the first experiment, so this is a, a collaboration with uh, Vanessa Ferdinand, uh, Hannah Cornish and Kenny Smith. And what we wanted to do here was basically an experiment that stripped out um, everything apart from um, the sequential nature of linguistic behaviour. So what we wanted to do was look at <clears throat> how people might learn and reproduce just simple sequences and then see how if we put that process of learning and reproducing in um, a cultural evolutionary setting whether we can get um, systematic structure in these sequences to emerge out of something that's initially random. So I'm really warning you that this is not going to look anything like language um, and things will get a little bit more like language in the second experiment. But bear with me because um, I think this sets the frame quite nicely for what we can expect to happen just out of the process of cultural transmission. Um, so this experiment is um, an experiment called the Simon game. Now that makes me sound like um, I'm extremely big headed calling experiments after myself. But in fact, the sign game is a toy from uh, my youth. Um, so it's a big plastic, uh, uh, simple toy where um, different lights would light up on the surface of the toy in sequence. There's four lights. And the idea is that you're meant to try and remember the sequence and then play it back by pressing the buttons in the right order. Yeah, so we made our own entertainment in the 80s. Um, so. I, was, I remembered this, this game from my childhood and I thought this might be an interesting uh, setting for a cultural evolution experiment. So in this experiment, we get participants into the lab and we get them to play this Simon game or a version of the Simon game. So what the participants do is they see on an iPad, it turns out, um, a sequence of coloured lights. Um, and then immediately after the sequence, they have to try and imitate the uh, sequence by just playing it back, okay? Um, and that's one trial. And after they've tried that, they get some feedback. And I'll show you what it looks like in a second in a video. So they do, they see the sequence of um, lights appearing and then they try and remember them and play it back onto the screen. Um, and then they get the feedback, how well they did with the score. And then they do it again with a different sequence. And they do this a whole load of times, so do it 60 times. And the important point about this, um, which I'll come back to, is in this task, um, they're not told that these sequences form part of a system or anything like that. They're just all independent tasks. Just copy this. Okay, now copy this, now copy this, and so on. So these tasks, these, these copying tasks are completely independent of each other. Um, so the participants aren't explicitly trying to learn a system. There's no system here. They're just a bunch of independent trials in this experiment. And the first participant into the lab gets 60 completely random sequences, okay, to copy. And the sequences uh, last 12, uh, 12 long, so 12 colors in a row. And um, they're completely, they're maximally entropic, which means that um, every color has an equal probability of occurring um, in the sequence. And then the next um, sequence that they copy is another random sequence and so on. So they just do 60 completely random sequences. Okay, so that's the first participant who comes into the lab. And crucially, what makes this a cultural evolution experiment is that the next participant, instead of getting a new set of random sequences, gets whatever the first participant produced. So when the first participant tried to copy a sequence, play in a sequence back, um, whether they got that right or wrong, the next participant will get that sequence um, to copy. So um, participant N get 60 sequences that the participant n minus one produced. Um, so we go, so each sequence that, that we started the experiment with goes 
into someone's brain and then back out again and then into the next person's brain and back out again and into the next person's brain back out again and so on so you can think of this as a kind of um what's called in some countries the telephone game where one person whispers something into somebody's ear and then they whisper it into the next person's ear and so on except we're doing this with these meaningless sequences of lights so this is what the experiment looks like um so have a watch and see if, see how well you think you would do so lights are flashing on the screen and then the participant tries to remember it obviously finds it's a little bit hard not sure and then when they're done it's stored and they get the next sequence and they get this feedback how well they did um, so the important thing here is it doesn't matter how well they did that that sequence they produce is going to be the one the next participant has to try and copy alongside all the other um, 59 sequences they produce okay so what happens so we can think of each of these participants as belonging to a generation and we can run the, we run this experiment a whole bunch of times with the, starting again with a new set of random sequences and these these um gen, these sort of chains of generations um we call them chains um allow us to observe the um the uh the evolution through 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 cultural transmission of a particular sequence. So here's an example. This is just one sequence in one of the one of the runs of the experiment. So here, generation zero is the initial random sequence that we gave the first participant. Um, here at generation one, that's what they produced when they tried to copy this, and so on. Um, this is what participant two did when they were given the output of participant one. And as you can see, it changes over time. And there's a while here where it's quite stable and then it changes again. So we can get these like nice lineages of sequences to um, investigate and see what the process of cultural transmission does. So what happens? So we ran um, six chains of, these, um, of this transmission experiment um, and each chain lasted for 10 generations. And here I'm plotting error, so how, how hard they found it to copy the sequences um, against generation. And what you can see is the task gets easier. And that's not because the, the participants are learning, because each generation is a completely new participant, right? So it's not that the, task, the participants are somehow changing in order to get better at the task. Rather, the task is changing in order to get better at being passed on by the participants. That's an important thing to remember. So the task is evolving here. Um, so how is it doing that? So one, one thing that we thought might happen is that maybe the sequences would just get shorter and shorter. But surprisingly, that didn't happen. In fact, the average length stays almost completely constant, which is a little bit surprising, actually. Here's an example of, of just a subset of those sequences. So here is the random sequences at the start of one of those chains. And here's what they look like at the end. And you'll hopefully, even though it's quite small on your screens, I hope you can see that there are similarities now that exist across the sequences in the set, all right? So they all start with red. In fact, most of them start with red, yellow, red, yellow. Um, this one starts red, red, yellow, yellow, red, red, yellow, yellow. Um, so looking at this, it looks like there's something going on here. There's something systematic that's appearing in this set of ostensibly independent tasks. Um, and uh, just to convince you that there's something interesting going on, let's try a little bit of kind of um, armchair analysis of this. So here's a sequence, red, yellow, red, yellow, red, blue, yellow, green, red, blue, yellow, green. You look at that and it looks like it has this kind of hierarchical structure. So there's a pair of red, yellows, and they're put together and then there's a pair of longer four long sequences red blue yellow green and they're put together and that you might not be convinced by that but in the same set of sequences uh, by one participant there's also this red red yellow yellow red red yellow yellow red green yellow blue red green yellow blue which again looks like it has um, that same kind of um, uh, repeating pattern structure so things like that are suggestive that there's something going on here. There's some systematicity emerging. 
In fact, we can do some analysis of this. So it turns out that the patterns over time become more predictable, less random, um, but also more richly patterned. So this is an analysis using a hidden Markov model um, to find, well, using a technique to find the best hidden Markov model that, that fits the set of sequences. And what we find is that over generations, the um, sequences are becoming more predictable, but they're also the best fitting hidden Markov model is one with more states inside it. So what we're, what we're suggesting is that sequences get simpler in one sense, they become more predictable, but in another sense, they get more complex. The, the grammars that produce them have more states. Um, and we can test this kind of systematicity that I'm suggesting is emerging um, very directly. And what we did was we got new participants into the lab and we test them on the sequences produced at the end of our experiments. And we have two conditions. So participants are either exposed to sequences that are all from the same chain, so that kind of evolved together, or drawn from a mix of different chains. And if there's systematicity there, then the participants who are exposed to a set of sequences that evolved together should find them easier to learn than um, a set of sequences that are drawn from different times we ran the experiment. And indeed, that's what happened. So sequences are easier to copy if they are presented alongside others from the same chain. So that demonstrates that the sequences now act as a system together. And remember, the task is set up um, as this kind of immediate and in independent imitation tasks. It's not like they're told that they're learning a sequence. So this system-wide structure seems to be emerging as an adaptation to cultural transmission. And that's happening even when we've set up the experiment and framed it as this independent imitation task. Um, so this is just to give you a flavor of what this cultural transmission process can do. It can create structure and it can create system-wide structure, even when we kind of stack the, game, the decks against that. However, this is kind of meaningless structure in a way. It's combinatorial structure, um, but it, they, these, this is nothing language-like. There's no communication here. There's nothing language-like here at all. Um, so this, this, this doesn't talk to, I mean, I, mean, I find it interesting, um, and it, it speaks to the kind of abstract notion of systematicity and structuring, um, but it doesn't look very linguistic. So what we wondered is whether we could do an experiment that was much more language-like and maybe reflected some processes that we see in the real world when languages emerge. So this is the second experiment I'm going to talk to you about. And this is uh, mainly the work of uh, Yasmin Motamedi, um, but the collaboration with Marika Skoustra, uh, Jenny Culbertson and Kenny Smith. And we're going to talk about this, this um, next, and it's about evolving an artificial sign language. So sign languages, to me, are the uh, most exciting source of data for anyone working in language evolution today. Um, and the reason for that is that all sign languages are relatively young and some sign languages are so young that we are in, able to witness um, the process of emergence of the sign language kind of right now today. Um, so emerging sign languages allow us to see language evolution actually happening before our eyes. Um, so these are languages that either emerge due to um, changes in, in uh, policy in a country that brings together um, previously isolated deaf individuals into deaf schools or clubs, or sometimes we have sign languages emerging due to um, the emergence of uh, genes uh, for deafness in a population, usually a, a um, uh, rural population where there is a lot of, for example, there might be a lot of um, uh, uh, marriage practices that promote um, those, the, the spread of those genes. Um, and so in both those cases, we can get spontaneously in a very, very short time, which I, by which I mean decades, um, the emergence of, of uh, sign language um, where there previously wasn't one. 
Um, so structure in these, these languages emerges extremely rapidly, but it's important to point out that it's not instant, um, so that we are able to observe a process um, happening. And it's not, just, it's not just like spontaneously, there's everything in the language is there. There is a process of emergence. Um, and this process um, actually differs depending on the social structure. So there seem to be differences between those two cases where I talked about the case of the um, uh, deaf school, deaf club um, uh, emergence and the cases of the kind of rural village sign language emergence. So there have been arguments about the fact that these different social settings lead to differences in the process of uh, emergence of structure in um, these emerging sign languages, which is extremely exciting and fascinating um, discovery of, of recent years. Um, what this to me highlights is that there are important processes that we can um, look at in the, in the cultural emergence and the cultural evolution of language um, that are revealed by the different stages of the emergence of a sign language. So um, often the um, first stage will be um, improvisation of ways of communicating um, by individuals who have no conventional systems to fall back on. So this might be home signing kids, for example. So these are kids, deaf kids of hearing parents often who um, construct and improvise uh, um, ways of communicating. Um, so that's improvisation. And then we have processes of interaction within a community. Um, for example, the kids that are brought together in deaf school, um, interacting with each other using um, their improvised uh, means of communication with each other. And then also transmission to new learners over time. So with this process that um, is very like the one I just described with the Simon game of iterative learning. So what we want to do is set up a, an experimental design that allows us to look at improvisation, interaction and iteration um, all happening in the lab. So that's what we're going to do. So we bring together, um, we're going to bring together three different empirical methods to study improvisation, interaction and iteration. So for improvisation, um, we're going to use the silent gesture paradigm. Um, uh, pioneered by Susan Golden Meadow, wh where participants are trying to convey meanings, um, uh, hearing participants are trying to convey meanings um, using only their hands and no speech. Um, for interaction, we'll use communication games, which a number of uh, researchers have looked at in psychology, where participants uh, take turns to be a director or a matcher, where um, the director has to try and get the matcher to pick a particular meaning out of an array by using communication. And for iteration, we'll use the cultural transmission experiment like the one I just showed you with the Simon game. So we're going to bring all of these things together um, to look at how um, uh, we might see the processes of uh, the emergence of meaningful language-like uh, systems um, in the manual modality. Okay, so this is the design of the study. It's a little bit complicated, but I'll work through it in a few steps. So we have, um, instead of a single cha chain of participants like we had in the Simon game, now every generation is going to involve two participants who are going to be communicating with each other. So this is like participant A and B are in the same generation, and participants C and D in the next generation, and so on. So this is in the main stage of the experiment. So pairs of participants um, are organized in transmission chains and there are five generations in each chain and there are five chains in total. Um, what happens each generation is that uh, each pair pay, takes part in two stages of the experiment. In a training stage, the participants learn the gestures from the previous generation so specifically, we take the gestures from a participant, one of the participants in the uh, previous generation. And in the testing phase, the participants communicate with each other using gesture. And the way this is set up is that the participants come into our lab, um, sit in different booths in front of a screen and a camera, 
Uh, they have no audio. Um, they are given instructions on the screen. And some of the time they're able to see streamed over video link um, what the other participant is doing. And some of the time they're gesturing to a, to a camera. Um, and that's how we set up the communication task. And I'll explain what the task is in a second. And the gestures from one of the people in a, each pair is used as training for the next generation. Okay. Um, so that's roughly in sketch form what happens in this experiment. There's communication uh, through interaction, and then there's learning, and there's communication through interaction, and there's learning, and so on. But for these kind of experiments, we need something to um, start the experiment off with. So we need um, a set of seed gestures. Um, so this is going to be like the initial random language, um, the, like the initial sequences of uh, random lights that we had in the Simon game. Um, so what we do is we get individual participants into the lab. They only see one of the meanings that's, that's in the experiment, and they have to tr produce um, gestures to try and convey that single meaning. And this collection of seed gestures are used to create the language that the first pair of participants is um, trained upon. Okay, um, so what are these meanings that I've been talking about? Um, well, we these are the meanings and they're arranged quite carefully on two dimensions, okay? So there are meanings like chef, restaurant, frying pan, and to cook. Um, so these are all meanings that relate to thematic dimension of food, um, but they differ on this kind of what we call a functional dimension. So it's a person, a location, an object, or an action. So we organize this um, set of meanings in this way so that we can, um, we can have meanings that have, share something in, in common. So like chef and singer, for example, are both people and chef and frying pan both relate to food. So they have similarity between them, whereas chef and camera are completely distinct. So this gives the meaning space a structure so participants are just going to have to figure out how to produce gestures to convey these particular meanings. So I think it will come clear to you when I show you some examples. So here's one example. So this is um, a participant in the seed video stage of the study. So we're, what we're doing here is we're just getting them into the lab and say, okay, um, you've got one task and only one task, and that's produce a gesture that conveys the meaning to make an arrest. Okay, and that's it. And they only do it once. So this is that, what that person did. It's kind of shooting, running, grabbing someone, putting handcuffs on them, handcuffs on them. Right, so that's an example of a seed video. Um, and so we have a bunch of those for all of these different meanings. Um, here's another one. So this is... Um, uh, the seed video for a church. Person walks into the church, looks around in awe, prays, crosses himself, prays a bit more. And there we go. So we have a whole bunch of these seed videos and we can use these to create the um, first stage language that we're going to give to our first pair of participants to learn from. So the way the learning works is participants are given um, half of the meanings with these gestures paired with them and um, they're just asked to um, guess what they mean and observe observe the gestures and both participants get those um, get that, that training okay so what happens so um, I'm going to show you the example of what happens to this seed video gesture of church and first, I'm going to show you the two participants at Generation 1, what they did when they were actually using church uh, to communicate um, with each other. And then, remember, this is passed down over multiple generations, so I'll also show you what that, that gesture for church has, has evolved into after five generations. Okay, so here's church, that's the seed video that you already saw. Okay, and now one of the participants of Generation 1, 
Okay, now that the other participant in generation one. So they're quite different from each other. Um, but uh, largely these these uh, gestures are successful. So, so in the communication task, uh, the matcher is given this gesture streamed from the other participant and has to select from that array of meanings what they think it is. Um, right now, five generations later, let's look. So here's church, there's a square, and then this. Um, and then the other participant, square, and then this. So exactly the same, and clearly divided into two parts. Um, so I hope you can see just from that one example, there's something interesting happened here. This 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 quite complex and elaborate uh, gesture has been reduced down into these two components. And it turns out that this, like breaking it down into two components is very, very common. And I'll show you an example. Now this, you won't probably won't, won't be able to see all the details, like you might want to peer at your screen a bit more closely. Um, this is one kind of stripe down that meaning space. So this is all for one of the experiments um, at the last generation. These are all the gestures one participant produced at one generation for, um, for one of the one dimension of the meaning for different people. So chef, vicar, photographer, and so on. Um, so this is the uh, participant at generation one for this um, slice through the meaning space. So you won't be able to tell what's going on. I mean, it's just a whole like, whole range of different things happening. I'll, it'll loop. So you can see there's a lot of different strategies for conveying these different meanings, right? All sorts of, kind of very pantomimic um, strategies um, for doing that. Now let's look what those all changed into, evolved into after five generations in our experiment. That's it. Now, hopefully what you can see here is for nearly all of them, they start with a point to self. So there's a point to self and then there's something else done. Two parts of the gesture. Um, and that point to self is used for all of the people. And a different gesture is used for, um, for example, the uh, locations. And a different gesture is used for the um, tools like frying pan and so on, the objects. Um, and so this, this really struck us that this looks like something um, compositional um, going on. So it looks like this, this uh, two dimensional meaning space has been broken down into these two components and they've been expressed compositionally with two, um, dare I say it, signs in a systematic way. Um, so we've gone from something pantomimic, so very unsystematic, imagistic and elaborate and redundant, into something I would argue is much more language-like. It's systematic and it's efficient. Now we can put some, um, um, we can put some numbers on that. Um, we can, so one of the analysis we did, probably the most um, easy to understand is that we actually went and counted the number of times one of these what we're calling category markers appeared so that's like this point to self marking person or this kind of square marking location and it turns out that these emerge over generations um, they develop cumulative, cumulatively over generations um, so participants introduce these markers for functional categories and they increase over time um, in this cumulative way. Now, interestingly, these, are both, these create both specific categories like person and location, but they also, there's evidence of much broader categories like the category between noun and verb here. And that's because typically verb, the actions um, were left unmarked. So very few of these category of markers emerged for verbs. So they emerged with the distinctions between different, um, different uh, nouns. So we have this systematic structure emerging on two levels here. The other things we can analyze is the efficiency. So it turns out that over time, the gestures become shorter in length and show fewer repetitions. 
So just to summarize that, we're going from something pantomimic to language-like. Specifically, these systems become systematic. Um, they have this, this kind of compositional structure emerging and they're efficient. Um, they're less repetitions on their sh and they're faster as well through this process of transmission from generation to generation and interaction in the pair in the diet. So interaction and iteration, that is transmission from generation to generation, lead to the emergence of something arguably language-like systematic structure out of this initial improvised pantomimic stage. But of course, we were wondering what does each of these two mechanism, mechanisms of transmission and interaction, uh, what does each of these contribute to this process? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you the same experiment again, but with just transmission and also just interaction. And we're gonna see what happens, okay? So we can isolate these two. So that was the design we, you just saw with both happening together. Now um, I'm gonna, we're going to show you um, a version of the experiment where there's just transmission from generation to generation. So there's no interaction, just one participant at each generation. And also an interaction only condition where we simply keep the same pair of participants in the lab um, for five times as long. So we don't replace participants each generation. So they just interact. Um, and we're gonna look at what happens in those two situations. So just a reminder, this is what happens with transmission plus interaction. We get this uh, systematicity. So here we've got the um, category marker and then thematic marker compositionally. So what happens with, let's say this, these two examples, prison and church in the transmission only condition. Okay, here's prison. This is after five generations. So there is the category marker there, but there's, it's repeated and there's all of this other stuff going on and a lot of repetition. So church, there's a box, there's crossing herself, there's a Bible, presumably crossing herself again, and there's the category marker again. So a lot of redundancy and repetition. So we do seem to get some structure, but it's, it, it's drowned in all of this like, uh, inefficiency if it's just transmission. Now what happens with just interaction? And it's very quick. Okay, so watch this. So this is prison. And that's it. Just one holistic gesture. No compositionality. This is church. That's it. So again, it's just one holistic gesture. So it, in interaction only, we get these very efficient gestures, but they don't have systematic structure. Um, and we can see that here. So, so this is the results you saw already with the increase in category uh, markers in the first condition with transmission and interaction. With transmission only, we get something very similar, the growth of category markers. But with interaction only, category markers grows initially after one generation and then, uh, well, after one round here and then is stalled. So without new people coming in, there's no cumulative increase in structure. Um, what we see uh, with transmission plus interaction here is um, a reduction in repetitions over time. That's what we saw before. Um, we see that even more so with just interaction. So it gets very, very efficient. And with transmission only, um, notice this is a different scale. Um, the the gestures become horrendously inefficient. They they just go on and on and on with lots and lots of repetitions. So what it looks like is that interaction leads to efficiency, and transmission leads to systematicity. Um, and when they're both operating together, as they are in the real world in language you get something that's language-like. You get efficient, systematic um, uh, signaling. So iterated leading learning from these first two experiments appears to lead to systematicity. And when these systems are used for communication, as in our interaction experiment, these language-like properties, like uh, efficient compositional structure, emerge. Okay, 
So the last study I'm going to show you is um, potentially slightly confusing one because here we've been building up to this idea that this process of cultural transmission and all the different parts of it lead to uh, language structure. And so the idea is that humans have language because humans have this cultural transmission system. But what we're going to do here is show that we can get the same thing happening in a population of baboons. So this is work with uh, Nico Cladier and Joël Faco and Kenny Smith. Uh, so Nico and Joël have this incredible uh, lab in uh, Marseille, near Marseille. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is a baboon uh, lab where they have these baboons that are free to roam in this enclosure. And there are these completely automated testing booths. So the baboons can go in and out whenever they want. Um, if they want to. So on sunny days, they don't get that much data. Um, and when they go into these booths, um, uh, the computerized automated systems recognize them and then serve them up a touchscreen experiment that's just for them. Um, so the baboon puts, uh, puts uh, their hand through these holes and a microchip in the baboon's arm is registered by the computer the touchscreen lights up and gives them an experiment that's tailored specifically for that individual. Um, and then there's a robotic food dispenser that will give them some uh, treat if they do uh, the task well. Um, and this means that you can set up experiments um, and run them in an automated way and get enormous amounts of data very, very quickly. Um, but also you can run kinds of experiments that would be impossible to do otherwise. And we realized that we could run one of these iterated learning experiments um, on these baboons. Now, we can't teach the baboons a language, but we can give them a task that is very quick and easy for them to do, but has the same face, similar in, in, in spirit to the Simon game, where they observe something and then have to recall it instantly. And then whatever they do on production, we use as the task for the next baboon that comes in. So this is what the task looks like. There's a bunch of lights, four of them light up, and the baboon has to touch the ones that were just lit less than a second ago. Okay, and that's it. Um, so lights, boom, boom, boom. And then if they get it right, they get uh, food reward. Simple as that. Um, and we can run uh, tens of thousands of trials of this experiment quite, quite quickly. Now, the way this experiment is set up, very like the Simon game. So we start off with 50 random grid patterns. So these are, um, the, the grids are four by four, and we have four cells lit up. And the, the, each animal gets 50 of these, just like the, the Simon game was 60 trials, this is 50. Um, each animal gets 50 of these, uh, these grid patterns. To try, and to try and copy. And whatever they do, whether they get it right or wrong, becomes the 50 grid patterns the next baboon gets when, when we're ready to pass that uh, on. And then uh, this set of grid patterns can evolve over, over multiple generations by this process of transmission. And what we also do is before they get the 50 grid patterns that's transmitted from the previous baboon, they get 50 random ones. And that's so we can measure their baseline performance. Okay. So what happens? So just as in the Simon game, it's list this graph. Sorry, this graph's the kind of other way up from the one you saw before. So this is the success. Um, so the blue trials are the transmission trials. And what we see is that over generations, uh, the task is getting easier. Now, remember, again, the baboons aren't getting better at it. The task is, is changing, not the baboons. Um, so over time, this set of grid patterns is becoming easier and easier for the baboons to copy. And we don't see a change. You might visually think there is one, but we don't see a change in the matched random trials. So somehow these grid patterns are uh, evolving through this process of cultural transmission to become easier to to copy for the baboons. So how's that happening? Well, I'm just going to show you one example from a, from a chain and hopefully it will become incredibly obvious to you what's happening.
Um, so this is a set of 50 random grid patterns at the first generation that was given to the first baboon. Now I'm going to color some of these in. I'm not going to tell you why. Um, uh, it, again, it will become obvious. Um, but the, remember, the baboons don't see these colors, right? This is just for the purposes of us visualizing the results. They just get them as you saw in the video earlier. So first baboon comes in, copies each of these in turn. And what you're going to see is what those grid patterns turn into, including the mistakes that the first baboon, baboon produced. OK, so this is after one generation. So this grid set of grid patterns turns into this, OK? So they've made quite a lot of mistakes. And I'm just going to step through. We went through 12 generations of evolution for this chain. And you can see that gradually the patterns are changing and then largely staying the same. And you can see there are more and more of these colored patterns. OK, so that's after 12 generations. Um, so you can hopefully see what's going on here. These patterns are changing into a very restricted set of um, subtypes of this. Uh, these patterns of uh, four colored squares, four squares being illuminated. And these are called the tetrominoes. So the tetrominoes are the finite subset of the regular square tiling with a connected interior using four squares. However, most of you will probably recognize them as tetra species. Now, it is no exaggeration at all to say that we were not expecting this result. Uh, there is no sense in which we thought that uh, our French baboons would uh, invent Tetris. Um, so this this was like this was a very much a surprising finding for us. Um, this is what the expected number of tetrominoes would be over twelve generations. Um, and in, this is what we actually saw over time. So we saw an increase in most of the different types of tetrominoes that you see in Tetris. Now, I'm going to argue that what's happening here is that the set of grids is becoming systematic. Now, you might question that. You might say, no, 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 that's not what's happening. It's just that these tetromino shapes are preferred in some way by the baboons. They copy them better, for example. So individually, each each grid is becoming like a tetromino because that's easier to copy. And it's nothing about systematicity. It's nothing about this set of 50. But that's not, not the case. Because we can look and ask the question, there are the tetrominoes easier for the baboons to copy? And remarkably, they're not. In fact, they're harder. So the baboons in these random trials that we gave them actually find the tetrominoes harder to copy than the non-tetrominoes. So they actually make more mistakes when copying the tetromino than a non-tetromino. However, in the transmission trials, as the number of tetrominoes increases, they get better and better at copying the tetrominoes. And so in the transmission trials, the tetrominoes are copied better. They're transmitted more faithfully. But it's not because the individual pattern is easier, but rather that they work together as a set. And this is just like we saw with the Simon game, that the set of behaviors, um, structure appears in the set of behaviors that helps the transmission of the individual behaviors, even to the extent of favoring um, uh, behaviors that individually would be harder than the norm. Um, so what we've seen here is that systematicity emerges through this process of cultural evolution. Now, it's important to realize this doesn't happen in nature for these animals. So it's not that the baboons have systematic, culturally transmitted behaviors like this. And yet we've created a situation where that happens in the lab, in this um, non-human uh, animal. So that leaves us with a bit of a puzzle. And this is just the last few minutes of my talk. I'm going to just touch on what we think the solution to this puzzle is. So this is uh, mainly work by my PhD student, James Thomas, um, looking at why it is that we have um, 
uh, this kind of systematic structure and other species don't. So, so far I've been arguing that, that um, cultural evolution is a crucially important explanatory mechanism for understanding the origin of structured behaviour like language. But culture doesn't happen in a vacuum. It has to take place as part of a broader evolutionary picture. So why don't other primates, including baboons, have systematically structured behaviour in the wild? When we've shown that we, we can induce it in the lab. Well, what we need to do is look more carefully at what makes these our experiments work in the lab. And it's this. So this is the part of the mechanism um, in the um, setup in uh, Nico and Joel's lab. This is the robotic food dispenser. Essentially, what we've done is we've given the baboons a super reliable reward structure. And in that experiment, we rewarded them for copying the behavior of the previous baboon. Now, the baboon didn't know, each baboon didn't know that that's what they were doing. They were just shown this and trained by a reward structure to do copying. Now, it turns out if you set up a reward structure right, you can get these animals to do these things. And once you get them to do these things, you get systematic structure emerging, right? So what's needed is this reliable reward structure for imitation. And so arguably, well, we don't have a robotic food dispenser that we carry around with us all day. Arguably humans are weird in that they have, I would argue uniquely among primates, an, in, an endogenous reward system that reliably rewards imitating vast sets of behavior. So that's what's unique to us. It's not systematicity per se, biologically, it's the, uh, it's the reward system for rewarding systematicity. So that's part of the answer. So we want to copy behaviors. The other part of the uh, um, answer is that we also seem to be very oddly eager to share meanings. This is something that uh, Tecumseh Fitch is called Mitteilungsbedürfnis. So this kind of oversharing that we do and these seem to be the two ingredients needed for language-like structure to emerge in our, uh, in our experiments. We have learning, that is iterated learning, the transmission of signals, which comes from some kind of reward system for imitation. And then we have this propensity to share meanings, which comes back through in, in it, it kind of reveals itself in interaction. So these two things, learning signals that allows for iterated learning and transmission of behaviors and sharing meanings through um, which structures uh, interaction. These two things together, these are the two mechanisms that deliver language-like structure. So if we want to understand the biological evolution of language, we need to understand the biological origins, the pre-adaptations for, uh, for this learning, reliable learning of signals and for sharing meanings. Now, very briefly, because I know I'm running long on time, I want to suggest an answer for where those two things come from. And that's by looking for similar traits in other species. So the first example I'll give you is the example of the Bengalese finch. This is amazing work by Kazuo Okanoya in Japan. So what he's shown is that this domesticated Bengalese finch, which was bred by Japanese breeders for plumage, not for song, ends up with a complex learned song that's more complex um, and more heavily reliant on learning than its wild uh, type, which is, exists today um, in the wild. And so in this, in this um, couple of hundred years of uh, selective breeding for plumage, somehow complex learned song has emerged. The other kind of touchstone example for me is uh, the example of the Siberian fo foxes. This is an experimental project um, where foxes were bred for um, lack of aggression. Um, and one of the striking things about these foxes is um, they become more like dogs. And specifically, they become better able to read social cues from humans. Even though the, the 
breeding program was just breeding on, on the basis of lowered aggressive response, um, they're able to do things like read uh, social cues like pointing um, in ways in which the, again, the wild type um, didn't do. Now, both of these cases involve a process of sensory domestication rather than direct selection for these two traits, the trait of learning complex song or following social cues. And it turns out that there's a growing body of evidence that um, domestication might apply to humans as well. So I want to suggest that domestication lifts the selection pressures that keep in place kind of hostile um, uh, uh, traits and respond and fear of uh, um, fear responses. Those are held. Those are held in place by natural selection. But domestication lifts those selection pressures, and it and I, I want to argue it, uh, it provides the headroom for the necessary pre-adaptations. These two necessary pre-adaptations of language to emerge, as we've seen in the birds and the foxes. So. The suggestion I have is that we um, have domesticated ourselves and that this laid the foundations for iterated learning. And it turns out that indeed uh, there's a lot of um, anatomical evidence um, and behavioural evidence that humans are um, a domesticated ape. We have a lot of the features also shared by um, a range of other uh, domesticated species, including changes to the to the skull, changes to sexual dimorphism, reduced aggression, and so on, that we see in other domestic species. And it recently is really exciting evidence um, from comparative genomics, which suggests that um, humans, um, compared to Neanderthals, have genetic changes that we also see in a range of other uh, domesticated animals um, across across nature. Okay, I'm just going to have to wrap up and conclude now. Um, so the process of iterated learning, I've argued, um, leads to systematically structured behaviours. And when these behaviours are also used for interactive communication, language-like systems emerge. And similar uh, processes can be seen in, an, an, in other animals, but only when they're given the right conditions experimentally. And what I think all of this work suggests is that the human unique propensity for language lies not in some special cognitive bias for linguistic structure, but rather an unusual mosaic of traits that favour cultural transmission. And I want to suggest that those traits might arise from a process of uh, self-domestication. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Simon, for this brilliant talk. Um, we will now start the question and answer session with invited discussant Limor Raviv. Limor is currently a postdoc, postdoc researcher at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at the University of Brussels. And we will start soon a Minerva, Minerva research group called Language Evolution and adaptation in diverse situations at the Max Planck Institute of Psych for Psychology. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to the more the more Revive's talk, language and society, how social pressure pressures shape the grammar of languages on Abraham Al Vivo series next July the 3rd. Thank you, Limor. Thank you for this lovely presentation and Simon for a really fascinating talk, really tying together uh, work of what uh, over a decade. It's it's uh, really exciting to see it all uh, it all come together. And uh, also for full disclosure, Simon and I were uh, working closely also on topics of self domestication. But um, I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of well a bit uh, start actually at the end of your talk and kind of challenge this uh, uh, hypothesis a bit more. Um, so you said that there's basically these two preconditions that we uh, that we seem to uh, have that are potentially missing in other animals. That's the, uh, a very strong reward system for social behavior imitation following social cues. And on the other hand, this shared meaning. Um, but you said actually very little about the second component. Yeah. 
Um, and I'd like to, well, before kind of diving into, ask you to uh, maybe elaborate a bit more on how domestication or self-domestication kind of lends itself to the second part, to um, the shared meaning. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's going to probably be a rather unsatisfying answer because mainly I wish I wish I knew. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that we have to understand. Okay, so first thing, like I and probably a lot of other researchers of all sorts have I kind of drawn to explanations that are very simple, right? So it's like, oh, here's the magic bullet, and that's a particularly seems to be an issue with research and language evolution in particular. People really want to distill this absurdly complex problem into these very, very simple things. And um, so, and, and in, a, in a way, that's what I've done in this talk as well. I've, I've said, okay, there's two things, right? So there's these two things, but there's one solution to them. And of course, that's not, that's not what's happening here because it's not, this, this domestication process does not automatically deliver up all the traits you need for language because otherwise you know your pet cat would be talking to you right so part of what's going on has to be something to do with the particularities of the species that's being domesticated so something about dogs for example meant that the domestication process enabled them to acquire really quite extraordinary intention Re in, in, intention reading um, for humans, um, but but that didn't happen with birds. Um, equally, there's something about birds. I mean, this is more obvious, right? That something about birds that allowed meant that the domestication process enabled their song to become more elaborate, whereas dogs aren't producing complex sequential learned signaling at all. So. I think that's one of the things I would say is that really to answer that question, we need to be looking at what the the wild, the pre-domesticated species had in terms of its it, its cognitive makeup. So, so for example, what is it about dogs that made them, if you like, be so on the cusp of being able to do this kind of uh, uh, intention reading? And you know, you could you could think about, I mean, I don't know much about dogs, right? So this would be pure speculation, but you would imagine it'd be something to do with the ecological context of, for example, a, a copper cooperative um, a pack animal, perhaps. Um, I mean, with birds, it's easier, right? Because there we already know that, 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 um, that learned vocal imitation has um, evolved um, Actually, it, it, it's evolved a few times in birds, but the vo vocal limitation already exists. So what, what domestication seems to have done is basically just dialed up the amount of learning and maybe dialed up the amount of complexity in the song. So that seems much more easy to imagine that that's, that's the domestication process um, freeing up traits that were already there. Um, so yeah that would be that would be my answer is it's not really an answer but but that that we need to think about the kind of nascent properties of the pre-domesticated species and then say well domestication as a process i mean arguably it's something very very simple it's it's basically reducing the selection pressures that favor fear and aggression i mean i think it's as simple as that Right. And and um, when you remove them, a whole lot of things kind of flood in to take take the take the place. I mean, I think we know more about the birdsong case because of Kazov Konoya's incredible work. But there, um, it's just things like these these birds when they become less fearful, are more able to learn, for example, from multiple tutors. Um, so then the complexity of the song can can potentially fall out in part just from the, the fact that they're learning from, from multiple different um, uh, male adults. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there are nuances on the fox story. Um, so there have been more recent papers that have suggested that these farm foxes, the, 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 the canonical story about the farm foxes is that the foxes have no um 
prior predisposition to any of these things um, that are seen in the um, Siberian foxes after domestication. And now it seems that, that actually that's not quite true, that there was some, some of those traits there potentially in the ancestral population. Um, I suppose the thing we really need to do to understand this process in humans is, you know, is go back and, and think about um, think about other close primates and, and what would domestication do to, to those uh, primates. And they're like the exciting work on things like um, uh, uh, bonobos, because those have been argued to also be somewhat self-domesticated as well. Um, right. So maybe that actually leads to kind of the follow-up question you were talking about, uh, basically the ecological niche in which also um, that promotes this reward for sociality and so on. And I think a, a very big component or you can call it a difference between the cases of, you know, the, the zebra finches and also foxes is that they were indeed domesticated by humans. And therefore maybe the social pressures are, for example, to understand um, human uh, human uh, fox communication or human dog rather than dog on dog communication. Um, and we as a self-domesticated species might have had a slightly different set of uh, pressures. And in that sense, um, kind of putting the self and self-domestication in a bit of a, uh, in a special position. So it's indeed not the case that our cats and cows and uh, other domesticated species and, uh, uh, have this complex communication. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. A process. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one thing we have to be careful with is, I guess, in a way, the fascinating thing about the Siberian fox experiment is that those foxes end up being very like dogs. But dog mm -hmm. domestication and this experimental process are extremely different, right? So the experimental process was very carefully done. So they were just selecting on how close they could approach the fox before it had an aggressive response. Whereas the natural process of domestication in the dogs would definitely have involved, well, not definitely, but presumably would have involved actual direct selection for things like intention reading, like you're gonna you're gonna want to keep the dogs <laughs> understands you. Um, so uh, it's a, in a way it's a bit of a surprise that you get so much for so little in the Siberian fox experiment. Um, right. Um, so there is another, I would say. Uh, kind of a broader question that relates to the beginning of your talk and to the end of the talk, you were talking about, um, yeah, what what we have that other animals don't have. And the other one, on one part at the end of the talk, it was about this kind of social learning and the, the copying and imitation. And at the very beginning of the talk, it was about, you know, systematicity of the communication mm -hmm. system that we don't find in other animals. And I want to ask you more about um, how you perceive this. So clearly there's a lot of evidence of social learning and imitation in animals. And there's also some some evidence for, you know, um, combinatorial structure, for example, in, yeah. uh, in bird calls. So is yeah. this more of a continuum rather than a dichotomy? And if so, how do you see the gap between yeah, them? Yeah, I, I, that's a really good point. So um, yeah, so I don't mean to suggest that, for example, but put it simply that we're definitely not the only species of culture. In fact, culture seems like every month that comes by there's another species where there's really good evidence that that it has culture which is super exciting um, for those of us who are interested in cultural evolution um, and uh, there's a whole range of species that have vocal imitation vocal learning um, so the bird, bird song is the obvious example but you know um, cetaceans, um, uh, bats, uh, elephants, um, a range of other species also do vocal imitation. And it's actually a very, very, it's, I think it's a very deep puzzle that's not yet answered is why these specific set of species have vocal imitation and among the primates, we're the only one. Um, and I think that's, that's a really interesting question. And once you have vocal imitation, you do have the potential for cultural transmission of song. And indeed, we do see that uh, in in cetaceans and birds. So there is this iterated learning process in nature. Now, what, what, but what is unique to humans, I think, is a pairing of this culturally transmitted rich set of signals with semantics, right? So we apply this learned 
uh, open-ended. Well, actually, I think open-ended is not as important as it might first seem, but we have this large set of signals um, and we pair that with semantics. So we use those signals to discriminate. And that's why I was highlighting these two processes. So you can think of the Simon game at, at the first experiment. That would be a reasonable model of something like um, birdsong evolution, for example. It's just copying signals that have got rich structure. We have also, we also have things like that in human behavior and we call them music. Um, right, so that that's that's a system of complex learned um, sequential behavior um, that's that's passed on through imitation. But we uh, also use this to uh, communicate. By which I mean we use it to um, make uh, distinctions between uh, meanings. And um, I don't think any other species does that. So that's why it's these two things together. So it could be we're just the lucky, we're just the lucky recipient of the preconditions necessary for for a uh, domestication process to reveal those two traits simultaneously, and that lo leads to language. Right. Um, so I'm going to ask a question that also appeared in the live chat uh, on YouTube. It's uh, something I've thought uh, of and also apparently other people have had similar thoughts. And that is that it seems that um, in the lab experiments, also in the uh, in the emerging sign languages and even with the bonobos, it seems like a lot of the systematicity or a lot of the changes actually happen in the very first couple of generations. Um, so that's something also observed uh, in your graph and in the examples. So what does that um, tell you also about the kind of relative role between, so it could be transmission versus um, communication, but also how much of these iterations are actually needed and what does this big leap in the first few generations tell us? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, but I would caution a bit by, so it's very difficult to talk about scale with these miniature experiments, right? Because like we got, we get people in the lab for half an hour and they convey 20 meanings or something like that. That's the order, right? And you compare that with a language where your participants doing nothing but learning for for many many years and the there's an open-ended range of things that they might want to communicate about so i think it's we have to be very very cautious about talking about oh a lot happened in that first generation for example um what we can do and i think it's a very useful thing to do with these kind of setups is say what accelerates and what decelerates that process and what happened, what does a second generation or a third generation do? Um, and there I think we can we can make some progress. So so um, the experiment where there was no turnover, so it was just two participants endlessly, you see that that they introduce a bunch of structure and then it just kind of ossifies, you know, it gets set in. And in fact, what happens is that over time, um, you it ends up being actually quite quite uh, risky for you to change the system right you've got a system that you're using to communicate and like you you know it would be a really bad idea to 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 change it and so there's this this kind of process of, of uh, you know it's kind of grinds down and it, it, it stays there what new learners do is they reintroduce the biases that they bring as learners and you and they um, and that ha can that ha can happen um, generation after generation and after generation. So you may well get this big jump in the first generation, and the reason for that is because there's nothing there already, right? There's no structure at all, and then subsequent generations can can push that ratchet forward a bit and a bit and a bit and a bit, and you can get accumulation. Now, specifically, what we have done is we can recreate all of these processes that I've shown you in these experiments in computer simulation. And that allows us to play with things, play with factors that we think might accelerate or decelerate that process. So there's a, a paper I have with Monica Tamaris that should be coming out later this year, where we look at the emergence of duality of patterning through this process in simulation. And we wanted to look 
at this specifically because um, there are some emerging sign languages or a particular emerging sign language that's been argued not to have duality of patterning and that's the al Sayyid Bedouin sign language. And um, our hypothesis is that that's because of the social structure in, in that setting. And we can recreate that in, in the simulation and we can show that we can basically slow down the rate of evolution of uh, duality of patterning in our simulations by an order of magnitude just by changing who learns from whom, keeping everything else the same, like the population size and the lifespan of the individuals and what they talk about, and everything's all the same, but you can you can um, you can change the rate of evolution by changing the kind of social structure and who learns from whom. So I think that I mean that's just a first step, but I think that's the sort of thing um, I'm keen on. And of course, your own work uh, looking at population size is the other, the other one way of looking at what that does is that changing the population size, either experimentally or in simulation, can change the way in which um, this process of structuration, if you like, that's a word, um, whether it happens quickly or slowly, basically. Yeah, so I, th there was another question in the chat by uh, Natalia Levshina, who was also kind enough indeed to mention uh, uh, this work. And I, she asks if um, my work about uh, you know the, the, the lack of transmission doesn't show that it's about interaction after all. And I think what you're saying and what I tend to agree with is that it's not just about interaction. It's about the fact that you introduce new people. You can introduce new people by having a community that's growing and you need to interact with different people every time. Yeah. Or you can introduce new people because there are new learners. And in a way, it's not a, a contradictory. It's just a yet another another meaning, another way of introducing um, new new minds yes <laughs> exactly so i mean i think that's right so the the key is to get so so my argument is that to get structure and this is a, this this applies to a surprising range of different linguistic phenomena not just these basic things like compositionality that i talked about today but even things like kinship systems color terms um logical um different different parts of semantics and so on they all seem to be explicable as this trade-off between simplicity and informativeness so languages seem to exist in this kind of optimal space between things that are simple and things that are informative and it's it's learning no matter how you construe it, it doesn't have to be kids it's just a process of learning that um pulls you towards simplicity and it's a process of communication that pulls you towards informativeness. Um, and uh, what I've focused on iterated learning over multiple generations, but there are other ways in which this learning bias can be felt. And one of them is if you're talking to new people. Another one is if you're talking about new things um, and, um, and so on. The thing I think that's special and why I hold on to uh, generational transmission is that it can go indefinitely, right? This this little boost from the from the process of learning happens again and again and again, and it never it never ends, right? You can always have more generations. Whereas when you're talking about like expanding meanings or increasing the size of the population or so on, yes, but it's somewhat limited, right? So, so you can expect to see um, cumulative culture happening when there's transmission to new learners and again and again. Um, yeah, no, that's a very good point. It's indeed, even in a big population, at some point you uh, cannot interact with everybody. So there's, yeah. even if you add more people, it's a, uh, yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. Um, there's another question uh, in the chat that uh, I thought would be a relevant question. It's a question um, that asks, to what extent do you interpret the result of these experiments as showing the evolution of thought as distinct from the evolution of language? So basically the question is, is the systematicity you observe a deep property of the mind that arises by these cultural process or must the systematicity of the mind be pre presupposed before the cultural story can be told? Oh, what a, what, a, what a juicy question. <laughs> uh, right, okay, so um, let me think, think this through. So I guess what I'm interested in is 
So my, my own personal interests are uh, those aspects of language that involve mappings from, um, from signals to meanings, where those meanings have some kind of structure. So, um, so the semantics ha is, is, you know, it's not atomic semantics. So, so I tend to assume um, a semantics that has some, some kind of interesting structure to it. So there's the question like, well, where does that come from? Now I have done some simulation work um, suggesting that the structure in semantics itself um, can evolve culturally. So we can set up simulations where agents in the simulation have different ways of conceiving the world, some of which are highly uh, elaborate and some of which are simple and um, they transmit a language um, and what happens over time is that uh, ways of conceiving the world that support a transmissible language come to the surface so that the cultural even cultural transmission process that structures signals may also structure uh, semantics but ultimately at some point it's going to bottom out in structure in the world so i, I think i do assume that the world isn't some kind of like uniform kind of <laughs> splotch. <laughs> like the world has the world has structure in it. That 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 um, brains that it, um, grow up in the world uh, uh, attached to, and that that is ultimately grounds out um, the structure of language. But there's another way of taking this question, which I think might be another way it was intended which is this process of, of finding systematicity, you know, where does that come from? I think that, the answer for that is actually quite simple. Um, so for the simulation models that we have of this, all that we need to assume is that there is a bias, a learning bias in favor of simplicity. And this is probably the most general learning bias you could possibly think of, right? So this a learning bias that favors simple explanations of the world. Um, and you are arguably brains, that's how brains are made, right? Brains um, build uh, simple explanations. So so is this bias for simplicity? Well, two things, is it is it something that is kind of what we're born with? And if so, at what point do you see it kind of um, evolve. So, is this something that is shared with other primates or with other animals? Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's completely it's completely universal. Um, so, sim so I just think nervous systems. That's what they do. They they um, they have a simplicity bias. Um, I mean, I mean, there, there is a sense in which this is kind of the universal. If there is if there is a universal prior, it's a prior for simplicity. Um, mm. Now, how that's actually cast out, um, you know, exactly what counts as simple is 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 really where the where the work starts, right? So, um, you know, I can build a model and I can say, okay, here's here's the um, coding length, which is a way of measuring simplicity. Um, here's the coding length of a bunch of different hypotheses about language, um, but the way in which I I work that out or where I put that into the model depends a lot on the primitives that I'm going, I'm using to describe my language. So um, that I think is, that's where I think a lot of interesting work comes in is, is, is thinking about to what extent can we avail ourselves of universal notions of simplicity when considering languages and to what extent do we need um, uh, primitives, grammatical primitives in, in order to do that and I don't think I'm um, I don't think I'm certain of the answer of that um, but what I think what I think I want to argue is that um, the process of cultural evolution will take a a pretty general simplicity bias and turn and 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 um, shape that into linguistic structure 
and that it's this linguistic it would be a mistake to try and build the linguistic structure that you get for free from the cultural evolution process into uh, your theory of the mind of um, of the language learner um, because it doesn't need to be in there right so I mean I'm thinking of things like you know deep neural networks and you know a, a, a simul computational models that try to simulate the you know the human brain and how it works uh, mm -hmm. implementing a simplicity bias there is a bit odd in these case these networks can learn anything and then I want to kind of push a bit and say, okay, so is this simplicity bias related to memory limitations? Because these neural nets are, um, they could learn a simple uh, hypothesis and a complex hypothesis. The only difference would be what is their capacity for processing and, and remembering. And so is that one way to model uh, a simplicity I, bias? I mean, I, I, I would be getting too far out of my com comfort zone, but my, my hunch is that um, the prior bias of a neural network will look very much like a simplicity bias. So a neural network will learn more quickly and more accurately problems that can be expressed in simple terms than problems that can be expressed in that that need to be expressed in complex terms. And I don't think I don't think that would be even controversial thing to say that that um, that the simplicity prior will be there in any learning algorithm that. Is capable of making generalizations, which yeah. would include deep learning networks. Right. Um, so there's uh, a few more questions uh, in the chat, which uh, are a bit more uh, um, specific, uh, but I think they're still worth asking. Um, one question is about uh, one moment. So one question is about the Simon game. Um, and here is a, a question of, do the participants that learn from the ones before them get the colors played to them at the same speed as they were put in, or is it always the same speed for everyone? And I think what this question is getting at is, you know, you can kind of measure also learning difficulty. Uh, and if there's more time, you might be able to learn more complex uh, sequences. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we decided to, so a couple of things I, I didn't, um, didn't, go over with that experiment. So one of them is that that the the uh, timing information is stripped out. So the sequences are played back in that kind of rigid isochrony um, every generation. Secondly is that the order is randomized. So the uh, like the participants don't get the 60 in the same order. And it's the same with the baboons. Um, we have done some experiments that look at timing. So Andrea Ravignani and Tanya Delgado and I uh, did an experiment it's very similar to the Simon game, but with a drum, an electronic drum kit or drum, single drum and a drumstick. And so people heard these random rhythmic sequences and then had to copy them. And it was the same structure. You heard a sequence, you copy it, heard next sequence, copy it, next sequence, copy it in a set. Um, and there we were looking specifically at the uh, inter-onset intervals and to see what would happen, um, again, whether they would get systematicity. And indeed, we did see systematicity. And one of the nice things is that we also saw the emergence of um, a whole suite of musical universals that, um, that we see in the world's languages, um, sorry, world's languages, in the world's musics. Um, appeared in that iterated drumming experiment um but 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 for me the interesting thing was again it went from independent behaviors and gradually formed systematic suites of behaviors so that's what we saw in that experiment the same game and in the baboon experiment as well okay. um another question related to this experiment um is a question that asks is there a typical order uh, for the touching of the individual squares in the tetrominoes? And uh, uh, if so, can you say something about that? Yeah, we wondered about this. We wondered if there was. And so one of the first things we thought was, well, maybe, you know, before we did the analysis of like, were the tetrominoes easier or not, we were thinking to do, is it just like less effort to not move your hand as much for the baboon? Um, uh, the answer is no, they, they don't seem to do the most efficient path. Um, they sometimes swap hands even. So they'll put one hand in and then just stick the other one in to do the next. It's just all over the place. Oh, wow. Um, okay. 
but also as we as we showed they're actually not they don't find the tetrominoes easier they find them harder yeah um, and there, there, someone asked um what do you consider then easiness of the task do you mean that it uses less energy to perform or the trajectories are getting shorter i think here you only mean accuracy so um, yeah so the ch chance that they got a food reward so they got they got less food rewards uh, for the tetrominoes in the random trials than the than the non tetrominoes and that reversed for the transmission trials. So I think what's what's going on here is is tetrominoes may be weirder for the baboons, um, but unlike the other patterns, they can gang together as a set, right? And I I actually think this might be a general process and, and kind of looking around for examples of it in culture that there may be behaviors that are individually non-optimal but when they when they occur alongside other similar behaviors they are more transmissible um so it's sort of like a, um you know a kind of a bit like things you get in biology with frequency dependent selection that you might get these these things that you might think why are we doing that well it's we're doing that because we're also doing all these other things as well and i think that's what's happening with the tetrominoes they have they are visually striking to the extent that they can boost each other's success one of the things i didn't show because i didn't have time was that different chains in that baboon experiment ended up with different uh, proportions of different tetrominoes. So you might get a, a culture that's quite into squares or another culture that is more into the T's and S's and things like that. In a way, what makes it easier is the similarity to other signals in the same set rather than the actual. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and when you think about it, that is what systematicity is, right? Language is, is if it's, if it's anything else, language is a behavior that humans produce in which individual instances stand in relation to other instances. Uh, at, we have built this like elaborate set of hierarchical um, patterns of similarity from all the way from, as I said, from phonetics up to, to pragmatics. And it's culture that, that built that. Yeah. So I have one last question uh, from a person uh, in the chat unless uh, other questions uh, come in. Uh, and this person says, in experiment one, your example trees look a lot like they preferentially complexify right forward. So the beginning seems to be the easier, kind of more repeated structured one. And then later on, there's kind of this tail of, uh, of more structureless uh, signal. So is that um, in fact the general pattern what do you think of that? And do and perhaps, and this is a question I think is also arises a lot in these types of experiments. Did you also test subjects from a non-SVO language? So maybe this also has to do with something about the the prior knowledge and the preferences of participants. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, I I think we did look at that, but I honestly can't remember what the analysis was of that. So I think we did look at where which parts of the sequence were best learned. Um, but I think uh, I seem to remember that it is indeed true that that, that um, it, the starts of the sequences are more faithfully transmitted than the ends. And actually when you even when you probably when you watch that video, if you were if you were trying, you might have found easy to remember what the first few lights were and then it's just like, what oh, the hell? Um, and and I think that's you see that in the in the productions. What's interesting to me is okay, that might be true, right? There might be something about about for that particular task, the biases and the ways in which we we do that immediate imitation recall. What's interesting to me is how does a culturally evolving system that has to be transmitted through that kind of bottleneck, that memory bottleneck, how does it respond to that challenge? And that's tends to be the way we think about these things now is if a system has to be passed on to individuals with certain kinds of biases, what kind of what do we expect to happen to that system? Um, and so so it's possible that that kind of early repetition is a way of like chunking that stuff to leave a bit of headroom for learning the bit at the end. 
In relation to different language types, uh, I, I hadn't considered this. I mean, we we tend to think of this as a completely non-linguistic task, so we would be expecting this not to to bring with it uh, biases from native language. But a bunch of other experiments we do where there is definitely interference from native language. Um, and in those cases, I do think it's really important to to run these experiments on diverse populations um, and to see if we can kind of uh, factor out native language effects. I would say that one solution to that worry that, that um, the language you speak will shape the outcomes of this evolution is to do computer simulation. So for each of these experiments, we try and also build an agent-based model where we can completely control what knowledge the agents have and try and see if we can get the same same kind of results coming out of simulation. Yeah. So an interesting, I think an interesting point, it kind of taps to what you just said, and then I think we'll end with this, is that um, it's a bit relating to, to the to kind of memory you said, okay, we the, the very beginning and then everything is kind of a blur. It, I think relates a lot to Morton Christiansen's like, you know, now or never bottleneck chunk and pass. Um, yeah. Do you have any kind of thoughts on how you tie these things together? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think this emergence of chunk ch chunks, right? He would call it the chunkatory. Um, uh, that that seems like a like a, a good uh, adaptation, if you like, an adaptation by the system to the challenge of being passed on. So I think that that I like that idea of you know having to do stuff now. I tend to not think, I mean, I don't think particularly in that Simon game, it definitely applies. Um, and I, there is a version of that sequence task um, in a paper that I have with Morton where we, where we look at the specifically for those kinds of evidence of those kinds of things happening. I mean, I think what I, my, my, um, my own biases is to look beyond the, individual items or the individual sequence or the individual sentence or whatever and look at the system so i think i'm i tend to lean towards thinking about um, simplicity and systematicity of the whole system and that leads me to think more in terms of learning biases rather than memory processes um, i think one of the funny things is that sometimes those things feel like they're pulling in the same direction and sometimes it feels like um, they're so similar that we get confused as to what we're talking about. So when I'm talking about things being simple, what I'm talking about is that the description length of the entire grammar is minimized. The compressibility than, in a way. Yeah, but it's compressibility of the grammar rather than the utterances. So for example, this is, I'll end on this thought, right? Um, if you look at those in the second experiment, when we ran the experiment with interaction only, we end up with these like atomic gestures, right? So each base, each of all of those, um, whatever it was, 16 meanings, more than six, I can't remember. Each of those meanings had an atomic gesture associated with it that was just completely idiosyncratic. It arose from the historical process originally it was iconic it became less iconic over time in the experiment each one is very um idiosyncratic they're very short they're incredibly efficient each gesture is just one often just one movement so in a sense each of those is very very easy to process it's 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 an incredibly efficient system it's not simple in the terms that i'm using because the grammar, there is no grammar, basically, that, that to encode that language, you'd have to list each individual meaning separately. So the coding length of that uh, language is, is, is actually maximal. Um, whereas if you have a compositional system where you go, right, this means place, this means something to do with church. So this is church. If this means person, then this is priest or whatever right each of those gestures is now longer so less efficient but the system as a whole is is shorter 
Um, so I think it's really important just to like, you know, keep our wits about us when we're talking about this stuff and think, realize that these things can actually pull in different directions. That for me, simplicity is about the, is essentially, it's about the emergence of grammar. Um, grammars are the simple solution to being expressive. Um, not necessarily the most efficient. That's a very good point uh, also to end on because uh, uh, we have no more questions from the audience. We've already been talking for a really long time and everybody's stuck with us. So it's uh, been great. <laughs> it's weird not being able to see you all. <laughs> yeah, Thanks so I'd like to, much. sorry? Thanks very much, Limo. For... No, thank you. It was really, really nice. I've actually, uh, this is the first time I heard you kind of talk about these three things together in this context. So it was, uh, uh, our learning experience for me too. Um, thank you very much.